Uh, good, afternoon. good afternoon. Spring 1969. That's dating myself a little. But spring 1969, I was a high school football player in Montgomery, Alabama. I uh, played for, at that time, an all-black high school in Montgomery. We, I played football and we were so excited because for the first time uh, since the state of Alabama had integrated their championship series, long time ago they had a separate championship for the black schools and then a championship for the, uh, the white schools. But they had, over the, the few years, had integrated the championships and so all the schools played for one championship. And for the first time, the all-black school that I played for had made it to the state championship and made it to the regionals in the state championship. We had gone far, farther than any uh, black school had gone at the time. We were so excited about that. And in that spring, we were getting ready for our spring practice. The positive part of that was most of that team was coming back again. The vast majority of the players that started on that team were all juniors, and we were going to all be seniors the next year. And we knew with that nucleus of players coming back, we had a chance to do something really special, something different as a team. We could win a championship with an all-black school. It was phenomenal. The opportunity was great. We were so excited. On uh, that spring, 1969, Friday afternoon, right before uh, spring practice started, we were called as athletes, football players, uh, to come to the gym and meet with our coach on Friday afternoon. When we walked into the gym on Friday afternoon, uh, one thing was different about this meeting with our coach that afternoon. That afternoon, there were four or five white men all in suits. They all sat there in these suits. And it's like, why is all these white guys at our school <laughs> today? And that was unusual. And what we found out that day, that afternoon, was they said, uh, we got good news and not so good news for you. The good news is that we think there's going to be great opportunities for you as athletes. The bad news is that we're closing your school. We are shutting down your high school now, and uh, you will have to go to different high schools. You all, as a team, will not go to the same schools. You're going to be divided up into four different high schools. And we're telling you today because spring practice starts on Monday. This is Friday afternoon. Spring practice starts on Monday, and we want you to have the opportunity to go to your new schools, and we'll tell you which one those are after this meeting. And you'll go to your new schools, and you get the opportunity to try out for that new team. That was disappointing to all of us that had this excitement about our, our new season. And so we end up, the school I was assigned to, I didn't even know where the school was. And so I got three days to find out the school and go in and, and, and meet the coach. And it was a, um, a school called Robert E. Lee High School in Montgomery, Alabama. Had been all white school. Uh, and no black players before. And it was, let's go meet the new coach. So on Monday afternoon, we find our way, about 15 of us find our way to the other school. And our rest of our teammates had to find their way to four different schools, uh, to the three other schools there. And on the, that, that four weeks of spring practice, as we journeyed in and out of the school, yeah, each afternoon, not knowing anybody at the school. There were people that called us names as we traveled back and forth and said, we don't need you here at our school. We don't need you as part of our team. And so all of that was rather uh, disappointing to our team that 
thought we had such great heights that we could, we could uh, climb to. So with that, we tried to integrate ourselves into a new system. We were, we were very fortunate to do that and to do it pretty well with most of our teammates becoming starters and players on the other teams. I was very fortunate in my uh, venture over at Robert E. Lee High School. I made the starting team. I was a formerly a pretty good football player. I had made all city, all uh, county at, my, at the black school. But me and my teammates made the team and we were fortunate enough to um, become pretty good players at that school. Uh, we ended up uh, winning a championship at that school, it, and I won't go into all the details of that story, but if you want to know the story, there's a movie called Remember the Titans. It's the same story, same exact movie, same thing. I can tell you the names of everybody in the movie, real names of everybody in that movie of Remember the Titans. That's the story. You, you can uh, go and, and look at that. Um, as I try to, so what, what I would like to do today is tell you three or four stories. I'm a storyteller. I want to tell you three or four stories. The stories will be based in racial backgrounds. Several of them, three of them are based in racial backgrounds. My challenge to you is to listen closely None of the stories and the principles of the stories have to do with race. Race is just a part that was mixed in there. They have nothing to do with race. The principles that I like for you to take away from the stories are principles that will guide your life and guide your success and guide your careers. It has nothing to do with race. The stories happen to be based in race. So from there, I'll tell you, I was very successful, fortunate to, to be very successful, became um, the number one player in the state of Alabama, voted as the best player in the state. I was voted the number one uh, running back in the southeast. I received a hundred scholarship offers, written scholarship offers, many more calls. I received scholarship offers from schools from Southern California to Notre Dame to Oklahoma to Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia, you name it, there was a hundred written scholarships. I had academic scholarships from Princeton. I was blessed to, to uh, academically make very good grades, so I had Ivy League scholarship offers. And so from there, I like to tell you a story about recruitment. As we started in the recruiting process, my mother and father said, this is wonderful, you've been successful in the athletic field, you've been successful in the classroom, you've earned these opportunities, we're gonna leave the decision of what school you choose up to you. It's your decision. The only thing we asked you is to not go to Alabama, University of Alabama, and play for Bear Bryant because we know that Bear Bryant is a racist. So, if I can, I was trying to get this to work, and let's see, yeah, can I do that? Okay, I can't get that to move. Where is my IT specialist? <laughs> Okay, this is an image of Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant was the legendary football coach at Alabama. He was the winningest football coach in the, the game in Division I football. And you know, as the dean asked me to speak, I said, I want to talk about Bear Bryant, but for most of you, you probably don't know who Bear Bryant is. So, you know, uh, from, from there, I said, let me find a, a, a reference point, if I can, for the students, and, and hopefully, can we move? Uh, 
Okay, I can't get it to move again. So, sorry. Okay, for, for a lot of you, you may know Coach Nick Saban, University of Alabama uh, football coach today. Bear Bryant was the Nick Saban of football before Nick Saban. So that's the, the reference point I, I want you to, to have. So with that, you know, the, the, the coach, came, uh, Coach Bryant was recruiting me from University of Alabama and it, it, it said, as my parents said, you can choose as long as you don't go to Alabama and play for Coach Bryant. My mother said, I know Coach Bryant is a racist. I saw him say on national TV that he would not recruit a black player. He would never recruit a black player. So with that, I went back to the University of Alabama recruiters and said, thank you for your offer, but I cannot come to your school and play for Coach Bryant. And so they went back and told Coach Bryant that uh, this kid from Montgomery can't come because of something you said. And he said, that's unacceptable. What do I have to do to change that? And my mother said, I don't think you can change it, but if you want to, you have to come to my house in Montgomery and tell me that you didn't say that. You have to come face to face with me at my house and tell me why I should send my kid to the University of Alabama and play for Bear Bryant. And so he said, that's fine, just tell me when I can show up. So Friday afternoon, six o'clock, Montgomery, Alabama, most famous coach in college football, the winningest coach in college football, shows up at my house and says, I'm here to talk. My mother met him at the door, at the, at the door, front door, and said, hello coach, thank you for coming. It is such an honor to have you at our home but I'd like to know why you're here. She said, I know, I saw you on national television say that you would never recruit a black player, and if I'm not mistaken, that young kid standing right there is black, okay? So, with that, Coach Bryant standing there, they're standing in the door, he's not invited in the house. They're standing toe to toe, and what he, he said to her said, Yes, Mrs. Stokes, you heard me say that. I did say it. And by the way, I, I did mean that. And it was somewhat of a pregnant pause like this. It's like, okay, so where do we go from here? And he said, but I was wrong. I said it, I was wrong but I'm still not here to recruit a black player. I'm here to recruit a football player. Your son happens to be a very good one and we'd like for him to join us at the University of Alabama. And she said, why would I send him to the University of Alabama? There are no black students there. At the time, there was a, a 12,000 students on campus. They had, when I enrolled, they had 26 black students out of the 12,000. So she said, why would I send him there? That who's going to protect him? Coach Bryant says, I will protect him. I will be his father away from home. That's important because I want you to understand the things that Coach Bryant committed to and what he said. He said, I'll be his father away from home. And she said, that's fine. You can be his father, but you can't be with him when he's walking across campus when he's by himself walking across campus, they're gonna call him names, they're gonna be ugly to him, and he said, yes, they, they probably would. You know, he didn't soft sell this a lot, but he said, yes, they, they probably will be uh, nasty to him. But, but I think he can handle it. If I didn't think he was man enough to deal with that, I wouldn't be here. And she said, that's fine. How are you gonna treat him? Are you going to treat him, uh, are you going to treat him the same as you treat everybody else, all your other players? He said, absolutely not. I'm not going to treat him the same. I'm going to treat him fair. 
That's an important point I want you to remember. So I'm going to treat him fair. So, as we go, go through this process, she finally, they're standing toe to toe. She hasn't let him in the house yet. She's just asking him questions. And she, he, she asked him a couple other questions. He answered to uh, her satisfaction. She says, oh, coach, why don't you come in? Let me get you a glass of tea. He came in, they talked for an hour. He and, and, and my father was wise enough to know this wasn't his day and time. He stayed out of it. <laughs> it wasn't his show. So at that point in time, uh, uh, after Coach Bryant left and his entourage, he had several people with him. Uh, the next morning at breakfast, I was having breakfast and my mother said to me, you know, it's, you, me and your father talked, it's your decision where you want to go, you've earned the right to do it. If, we, if I were you, I'd think seriously about going to the University of Alabama and playing for that man. That's the kind of impression he made on her. Fast forward a few years, I go play football at Alabama, had a very good career at Alabama. It was fun. Coach Bryant did everything. He said, I'm, I, I'm going to move away from there for just a moment. I'll come back to Coach Bryant and some of the things he said. I start a business career. I get my education, I get my business degree from the University of Alabama, very good business school. And if I had time, I would tell you how difficult it was for me to get into the business school uh, at Alabama as an athlete because the, the coaches didn't want me to go there, but that's uh, for another day and time. But I, I was fortunate enough to get my degree. I started my insurance business, I started in the insurance business. I was the only black insurance salesperson in the Southeast for any company, Metropolitan Life, Prudential, you know, Provident Life, any, Blue Cross, it, there were no black sales reps in the Southeast anywhere. I was chosen to be that salesperson. So as I started my career, one of the fun things was Provident Life and Accident hired me to do this because the, one of the people that had recruited me to go to the University of Alabama was an insurance person, convinced them to hire me pretty much sight unseen. And so they send me to Greenville, South Carolina to work in their Greenville office. Just the sidebar about that one, they could not find an office. They had an office in Birmingham, they had an office in Memphis, they had an office in Nashville, they had an office in Chattanooga, they had an office all. They couldn't find one office that was willing to take me. They called their Greenville, South Carolina office, which was one of their larger offices, and they talked to the manager who was a very strong, dominating manager, and they started the psychology of, you know, we got this young kid that's supposed to be pretty bright, but we know we can't send them to your office because your customers would not allow it. Your customers wouldn't let them come into, uh, wouldn't come into your office and, and deal with him. And so we know we can't send him there. And so this man finally after, my customers don't tell me who to hire, my customers don't sell. send him here. So I get a job in Greenville, South Carolina. By the way, the sidebar of that, the, the guy who said, send him here and, let, and I'll take him, was from Mississippi, former Ku Klux Klansman, really good guy. It's like, goodness gracious, am I happy. I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> As I started my career working for him, a, guy, a gentleman by the name Marshall died. I, he trained me, he trained me very well. My, one of my early sales calls, again, all kind of based in race, but none of this really has, and I'm gonna ask you to, to, to connect some of these dots here, so pay attention. I know some of these stories you will, will resonate with you, some won't, but stay with me. I learned my business and my, one of my 
early calls was I had to go down to Georgia to try to sell insurance to the president of a small company in, in uh, I guess, East, uh, East Georgia. And at the time, my boss came to me and says, I'm sorry to tell you, I don't want you to go. You can't sell this, this case because I found out, unfortunately, that the person that you're going to meet with, the president of this company, is uh, a pretty racist guy, and he's probably don't want to meet with you. So I'm going to send your assistant. I had a person working with me. He's, I'm going to send him. Said, you can't send him. He's only been in the business two weeks. Two weeks. He can barely find the office. I said, so you can't, you can't send him. You know, I get paid to do this. I'm going. So I go down to uh, North Georgia. I meet with uh, the president of this company. I try to sell him our insurance program. First thing, he would not speak to me. He would not shake my hand. He would not look me in the eye. And as I sat there and did my presentation, I have my assistant who's been in business two weeks, really can't spell insurance. He asked this person every single question. He never asked me a question. I was the one have, having to answer the question, even though he asked my assistant all the questions. I answered the questions. By the way, I didn't answer all of them correct, but I answered the questions for him. And we finished our presentation. He got up. He wouldn't shake my hand, and he did not buy the insurance from me. It wasn't a successful call. I went back to my office. The first thing my boss greeted me at the door and says, how did it go? Did you sell it? I said, no, sir, it did not. Didn't, uh, we weren't successful. He said, I know you wouldn't because I told you this guy was racist. He wasn't going to buy from you. It's not your fault. You did your job well. You know, it, it's, it's, it's fine. You can go home. You had no real chance to sell that case. So. Good for me. I can go home. I can sleep tonight. I can feel good about myself because it wasn't my fault. I didn't do a poor job. But this is one of those things where, you know, and I'll ask you, have you ever had someone that loved you enough and cared enough about you that they wanted to make excuses for you? This man was making an excuse for me. I didn't answer the questions right. My presentation wasn't very good. I didn't know the answers to several things he asked. So when I got through thinking about my presentation to this gentleman in North Georgia, even though my boss gave me this wonderful pass, this excuse of, Ralph, it's not your fault, I knew I did a very poor job. And I couldn't go home and sleep that night thinking it wasn't my fault because I knew it was. I did a really poor job. I can't tell you how, whether the man was, the decision was based in race. I don't know. All I know is that day my mother would not have bought that coverage from me because, based on the performance I gave. That's the truth. So I made a decision that day that from that point on, I would have to answer four or five questions about my performance, myself, before I could ever say it was the customer's fault, whether they, it was racism or whatever their feelings were, before I could ever think about going there, I had to ask myself, did I know my materials? Sales is a need-based uh, uh, program. Did I address the needs? You know, when you're, when you're reading, uh, when you're making a presentation like today, you, 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 you're supposed to read your audience to see the faces. Like, you know, the, the guy sitting back there that's half asleep. I'm okay with him today, but I'm reading the fact that, that, that this part of the story may not excite him. Some other parts will. But you read your audience. You pay attention. You know the materials. You do those things. You know, those are basic things in a sales presentation that you have to do. I made a list of several questions that I had to ask myself, did I do well, did, did I do these things well 
before I could ever think that it was someone else. I had to own my performance. It's my job, it's my responsibility. I own that performance. So from that point forward, I prepared better, I knew the material, I knew how to make a presentation, I engaged the audience, I allowed input from the audience, I did those things. Fast forward, now I may say that word a few times. Fast forward, four years later, if I can get the video to work again, we're gonna try, try this and fast forward four years later. I go to a small town in Middle Tennessee I have to make another presentation. It's four years later. They tell me again, Ralph, you can't go because the person that's the president and CEO of this company that you have to make the presentation to is not just a Ku Klux Klansman. He is the imperial wizard of the Middle Tennessee Ku Klux Klan. So you can't go. You have to send your assistant. At this point, I had an able-bodied assistant, very skilled, very good. I could send Bill, but I, I noticed on my paycheck that it had my name on it. <laughs> and it had my address. My wife sitting there, she likes paycheck because she likes to shop. But I, 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 I didn't say it. But, I noticed that my name was on there. If my name is on it, then it's something I need to go do and earn because I get paid to do this. I don't send my assistant. So I said, no, if they want to buy insurance from our company, they have to buy it from me. So I'm going to McMinnville, Tennessee. I wasn't going to call her name. But I'm going to McMinnville, Tennessee, and I'm going to make the presentation myself because that's what I get paid for. So I go. I make the presentation. I take you, Bill goes with me. When I walk in, they wouldn't speak to me. They wouldn't shake my hand, and they wouldn't look me in the face. They asked Bill every single question in that presentation. I answered every single question during that presentation. I let them ask me questions, ask Bill questions. I read their faces to see if they were engaged. I knew the materials. We sat there for almost an hour. You know what happened at the end of that hour? Anybody want to venture to guess? They shook your hand. He stood up. He shook my hand. He said, thank you. He bought insurance from me. The Imperial Wizard of the Middle Tennessee Ku Klux Klan bought insurance from me. Four years earlier, if I had accepted the excuse that my boss wanted to give me, I could have gone home and slept really well at night. It wasn't my fault. I did okay. Four years early, he wanted to help me because he liked me. He wanted to make life easy for me. I could have accepted that. I wouldn't have gotten better. I wouldn't have been good. I wouldn't have sold insurance to this man wearing a sheet. But I made a commitment to myself that I had to do my job well. I work to improve my skill sets, to my knowledge, to know it. So the principle here, again, I don't want you to get lost in the race or the clan or any of that other. That's immaterial. The principle here, connecting the dots for you, is that you make a commitment to yourself to be the best you can be to develop your skills to your maximum, invest in yourself, know who you are, make a commitment, and be good at what you are, but don't accept the excuse. Don't accept the excuse from anybody. 
work your tail off, and be good at what you do. I would not have been successful that day had I not worked and taken four years earlier and ignored the excuse. Okay. So, that's one stage of it. So now let's, let's move on to another stage. We continue to um, develop our careers, but I want to back up a little bit to Bear Bryant. Back to college for just a moment. I was fortunate enough to be a pretty good student, play football at Alabama. So I think it was my sophomore year, junior year, somewhere in there. And I was walking out of our cafeteria um, at lunch and really wasn't paying attention going to the parking lot. And I walked into Coach Bryant. And he stopped me and he said, Ralph, I just got off the phone with your mother. Just had a conversation with your mother. I told her that what you did will never happen again. I was very disappointed in you, and it will never happen again. I made a commitment to your mother today that that would never happen again. I got that look on my face just like you got. I don't know what the man's talking about, you know. <laughs> it must have been bad because it's not going to happen again. And he's already promised her that it's not going to happen. What is it that I did that was so bad that it's not going to happen again? And he's already called my mother and told her, I made a C in my major. I made a C in a class in my major that I had no business making a C in. It's not that I, I, I wasn't, I was that smart that I should never make a C. I was, but the, the point was I didn't work very hard at it. It was my major, and I made a C. And he knew I had greater capabilities than that, and he's already picked up the phone and said, I own that for him because I made a promise to you that I was going to be his father away from home, and I will do that, and he will never make another C in his major. And by the way, I never made another C. <laughs> so, the, uh, a, a, a little while earlier, a, a, a little before that, I had gone to Coach Bryan's office. One of the things that you, you try never to do is to go to Coach Bryan's office. They don't go to Coach Saban's office these days voluntarily, and you just, it's like going to the principal. You just don't go there unless you have to. So I go to Coach Bryant's office. I take two of the other black players with me. We only had five at the time on the, on the roster. Out of 125 players on the roster, we had five black players. I take a guy named Sylvester Crooms, who became the first uh, African-American uh, coach in the Southeastern Conference, who is, a good, who is a good friend of mine and was my teammate, and a guy named Mike Washington. And we go to meet with Coach Bryant. And I go into it, and, and they don't even know kind of what we're going for. They just follow me because I do stuff like that. So we go into his, uh, his office, and I said, Coach Bryant, I wanted to meet with you today because in the African-American community, Wearing a mustache is a sign of manhood. And we have a policy at, this, at the school at this time on the team that you could have no facial hair whatsoever. No beard, you know, even as cool as you look in that beard, you don't look that cool. As cool as you look in that beard, you, can, you have no beards, no mustache, no facial hair. And I said to Coach Brian, much like you know, in the Jewish community and your bar mitzvah, a mustache is a sign of manhood in the African-American community. And 
I feel like we should have the right to grow a mustache and I want to ask you for permission for the African American players to grow a mustache um, on, on, your, on the team. He looked at me, Sylvester Croons and Mike was standing back and he's like, what did this boy do? So he looks at me and says, that's why you came in here? That's the reason for it? Yes, sir. And he politely said, wasn't real polite, like, get up and get out of my office. Just get out of here. No, you can't grow a mustache. You can't do that. The policy is no facial hair. So that was the spring. We leave. Mike and Sylvester's mad at me for doing that. It's like, ah, oh, what are you? So we move on, leave that behind us. We come back in the fall of the next year and we get a call from Coach Bryant, assistant says, Coach Bryant likes to see you guys in his office. He calls three of us and he calls, at the time we had added Ozzie Newsom, who is the GM of the Baltimore Ravens now. Ozzie was on the team. So he calls the four of us in, the, in his office. And so we go and, they, and they're looking at me again because for some reason they think I do stuff. I don't know why. It's like, what did you do wrong? Why do we have to go to this man's office? What's wrong? I, I have no idea. I don't know why the man's calling us. I have no clue. So at this point in time, he, we sit down in Coach Bryant's office and he says to us, um, you know, last year you came to me and you asked a question. And I want to tell you that I talked to several coaches, I've talked to several people, and I found that what you told me was true. That having a mustache in the African American community is a sign of manhood. It is important. And I've made the decision that I will allow our African American players to have a mustache can't have a beard, but you can have a mustache. Okay, let's back up a little bit from there. Several years earlier, he stood at my mother's door and he said to my mother, I'll be his father away from home. And he did. He said, I will protect him, but when he's walking across campus, he has to be man enough to deal with it himself. I was. When, he, when we, he said to my mother, my mother asked him, would you treat him the same? He said, I will not treat him the same, but I'll treat him fair. Everything he committed to, he did. The reason I tell you that, connecting the dots, uh, the principles of life, he was a great coach because he knew football. He was a great man because he lived up to his word. He did what he said. You could trust him to do what he said he, said he would do. In life, I would tell you, one of the most valuable things is being a person of your word. Having people to trust who you are and trust that what you say is what you will do. Okay. So that's, that's the connecting the dots of, of, of why Coach Bryant was a great coach and why he was a great man and he made great men out of the players that played for him. Okay, last part of this, this story I like to tell you is, is how did I get there? How did I connect the dots of wanting to be this great player and believing coming from Montgomery, Alabama that I could become this great player and this great uh, person. One of the philosophies in life is, is you gotta be able to believe it. And, and one of the keys to believing that you can do something is seeing that you've done it or seeing others that have, have done those things. I didn't have a lot of people that I could look to to say, wow, you know, from my community, they've done that, and I believe I can do it. But what I did have was a dream. I dreamed it. And that old saying, if you can see it, you can believe it. If you believe it, you can achieve it. I saw it. 
I believed it. I knew I could be successful. I dreamed it. The thing I would ask you to do is don't let anybody stifle your dreams. Dream big. Believe you can do it. See it. You know, one quick story of playing in the championship football game at, in high school, we were fortunate to get to this football game and we were competing against a very good team out of Birmingham and the game was very close and right at the end of the game with a couple of minutes left in the game I fumbled the football coming out of my end zone on about the seven yard line and the other team recovered the fumble and they have the football to go in for the winning score to win the championship. I walk off the field in tears. I, I am in tears because I've given away all the things I fought for and my teammates fought for. I just gave away by fumble, fumbling the football. A friend of mine that I played with since it was the third grade that later played with me at Alabama and, and played in the NFL for 10 years grabbed my face mask as I came off the field and says, what are you crying for? He says, I'm going to get this football back for you and all I tell you, when I get it back, you go score. And I said, Mike, if you get it back, I, I'll score. I mean, just go get me the football. Okay. So, let me move away from there. For just a second, I'll come back and tell you what happened. My father owned a barber shop. My father was a barber, and if you, you've seen it in, in TVs for bar, about stories about barber shops, it's a bunch of old men, black men, sitting around on the barber shop telling stories, telling lies mostly. But <laughs> they, they sit around and, and tell stories out there in, in the barber shop. And every Saturday afternoon, after all the, the, the haircuts were done, my dad and these men, all of his friends, would sit around the barber shop and they'd swap tall tales. I would go into that, that uh, barber shop with them and I would talk with those men and I'd tell them my dreams. I would tell them, I, I bet you, I, I, I can't tell you a number of times I sat there on Saturday evening and says, let me tell you about the championship game. Let me tell you what's going to happen in the championship. It's not that I'm making this up because I've seen this. I've dreamed this. I've seen this. Let me tell you what's going to happen in the championship game. I'm going to get this ball. I'm going to score the touch. I, I'm going to do this. I can tell you what I'm going to do because I've seen it. I know I can do this. And I've told those men there so many times that I believed it, they believed it. On that Saturday night in, in Crampton Bowl, Montgomery, Alabama, those men, this is a true story, those men were in that stadium that night for the championship game. The people sitting around those, pe those men said, when Mike Washington intercepted that pass in there, we could tell everybody around us what was going to happen because we had seen the play. We knew what was going to happen. I had told them my dreams. They started telling the people around them what was going to happen. Coach Jim Chafin called A24 right, give the ball to Ralph. I scored the longest touchdown ever in playoff in the championship game at that time in the state of Alabama. We won the championship. I had seen it. I had done it. I had dreamed it. Don't let them take your dreams. Don't be afraid to dream. Dream your dreams. See your victories. Now, as I say, you, you just can't dream a dream and think you're going to get there. You know, it, it, it takes talent. Talent is required, but talent isn't sufficient. Please know that talent is really required, but it's not sufficient. 
You have to mix hard work with it. There has to be a commitment. One of the things Coach Bryant used to tell us, and I won't tell you exactly the way he said it because he was a little bit more colorful, but uh, in there it, it, it was to say, winners make commitments. Winners make commitments, others make promises. And what he said in there, what he meant with a promise, a promise was conditional. The promise had a condition that, well, I'll do it if. You know, like I'm going to work out every day if. But a commitment is, I'm going to do it. It has no conditions. It's, we're going to do it. Like for me, it, it, okay, I got to keep talking. Okay, for me, it, I grew up in the state in Montgomery, Alabama, where I was very fortunate to say to be a good football player. And they, they would tell me that the hottest part of the day was, was noontime. I found out the hottest part of the day in Alabama was from 1 to 3. So when I went out to work out, I went out to work out at 1.30 to 3 o'clock because I wanted to be out there at the hottest part of the day. I made a commitment to myself to be the best that I could be. And I was going out there whether it was hot, whether it was raining. So, so you know, dream your dreams, but make a commitment to working at it. You know, you have to be willing to commit because talent, you know, talent is required. It is not sufficient. You have to outwork the other folks. And if you believe that, you can get there. So dream your dreams, make your commitments, be willing to do that. So I, uh, I'll wrap up with this because I know.